down front, so I got that massive big room. Yeah, these, uh, well, this is still a crab boat because they have crab boat stuff. Like that hatch there goes down to the hold. This, uh, Normally, this upper deck here isn't here. That was built for these guys. I watched this boat on season two. All right on. Season two. Season two what? Uh, Deadliest catch. You were on it? No, I watched the boat. Oh yeah. I watched every episode. All right on. <laughs> I watched one and realized I wasn't on it, so I couldn't watch it. <laughs> So were you actually a uh, crab fisherman up in the Bering Sea? Oh yeah, I just got back from the Bering Sea six okay. weeks ago. I still do. Okay. After six months. I've been, you know, I got that in my little speed. Yeah. Um, I started fishing up here in 77, Bering Sea in 78. Oh, okay. So I know all the guys. Oh yeah. I see them all the time. Phil yep. is one of my best friends. I've That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Guys, just for a second, can we get you to stand up? No, no, I know. Ron, you need to move. He's going to back in there. Okay? Or he's going to pull in there. Back. You're headed there. Like, like, people ask me. Because, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I'm back right in there. I was, you know, Jonathan and I grew up. Yeah. And I'm going to back in there. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 A professional right Good there. Man, yeah. Get you a job as a truck driver for Walmart. says that all throughout yeah, the show. Yeah, yeah. I like to be on my own. Yeah, yeah. And Edgar, he's, yeah, he'll talk. I miss Edgar from the show. Yeah, you know, he met, you know, the thing is, people say, like I talk to Edgar, Edgar's still on the Yeah. But now, are, are Josh and Casey still running that boat? Nope. They sold it. Okay. Formula 3 is owned by Trident Seafoods. Yeah. And they use it, like, I delivered to them three times this winter. They use it to come and get our fish. Okay. They do the tendering, yeah, yeah. Casey, I 
Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, because I know after Phil died, Josh went and he ended up trying to buy the boat. At least on the show. And then and then that didn't work out to him and Casey. They partnered it, it was it was explained, I did some research and whatnot that they didn't actually he didn't actually own the boat anymore, but he was running it for the owners or whatever. And right, right, yeah. Cornelia. Cornelia Ralph Collins called me Cornelia. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem like the two of them, him and his brother, really were into making that a priority in their life. They just liked the fame. Yes. And yep. Casey was a good fisherman. Yeah. And he, he, did a, he was a professional fisherman. Mm -hmm. Josh ended up being a professional deadliest catcher. Yes. Which yep. is sad because I had talked to him about it. Yep. It's sad. You know. So I guess, you know, um, watching. Um, now th this boat doesn't commercially fish anymore, right? Yeah. All right. You too, Justin. I'm Ron. Ron, Captain Ron. All right. I've been Captain Ron for over thirty years. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, he still fishes crab. Yeah, he just got back two weeks ago. From salmon tendering. Is he, uh, is he a captain or something? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he captains an actual crab boat. Is it this for now? He's like, oh, I gotta go do some captain things. Professional crab. All of them. All of them. Yeah, Andy, Big D. Actually, Maddie, that's her pick. That's, she's on the anchor chain. She went uh, snow crab fishing a couple, oh, okay. a couple years ago. And uh, like I said, I still, I just got out of the Barry Sea after six months. Yep. I still do it. Uh, my boat is out of Kodiak right now, long line. Okay. And, uh, What's the name of your boat? Fogback Straight. I used to have the Mary J. Okay. So, 110 foot crabber. And uh, Andy, and I'll, I'll, when I introduce yep. you, yeah, we're all, you know, I'm the only one still doing it, but we're all professional fishermen. That's all we've ever done. Now, are they actually going to open up Red King this year or not? Sounds like they might, like a 3 million pound quota. Oh, because I, I know that's, it, you know, the price of crab has been insane because the, the Red King has been shut down and then the Opelia was shut down this year too, which yeah. is huge. So everybody's, you know, everybody's like, oh, we're getting snow crab. I go, well, you're not getting Opelia, you're getting Tanner or Bear Dye. <laughs>
Yeah. Oh, I, I, I'm completely fascinated. Like I, I've been watching because I know some of the boats, home port, and some of these smaller. But I know they're all out salmon tendering. So it's like I've been. Wa I'm like maybe I see like maybe I see. So he said for me to be the last one to get off the boat, they'll take me up to the wheelhouse and can sit in the wheelhouse right where the wave hit. And he's on the show, the waves hit the wheelhouse and he did a bunch of damage. But he's like, you could sit in the seat in the wheelhouse. He goes, get your picture taken. He goes, just be the last person on the boat. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us. My name's uh, Ron Zwall and I'll be your captain today. I've been fishing the Bering Sea for 47 years. I just got out of the Bering Sea after six months. Been on land about six weeks. Um, I've owned three boats. I've owned a crab boat, 110 foot ferry today. Uh, tell you a little about, a bit about the boat you're on here. David, the owner of the boat, and I, well, we've been coming up, you know, to Alaska. We take our boats down to the lower 48 to get work done. And we had smaller boats that we, we fished. And we pulled into Ketchikan on our way up, and then we started seeing these cruise ships with thousands of people coming off. And we always thought, what the heck's going on? And then one time, tied up, this boat comes alongside, tied up by us. There's about 100 people come off this boat. going on here? He goes, he goes, you see all these cruise ships? People pay me to take them out here and, and see, uh, catch a cab from the water. And they pay me for it. And I do two of these a day. You know, it kind of upsets, you know. We thought, wow, what a kind of a rip off. You know, it was probably good for some people, but we're fishermen. We thought, you know what, why not take people out and not only show them what's above the water, but let's show them what's below the water. Why not hand these people what we catch and talk about them and show them and take, they get their pictures taken with crab and whatever we catch in the bottom. Yeah, because this guy goes, oh, we'll see a whale once in a while, an eagle, and, you know, it just didn't sound right to us, you know. Um, everybody on here is a is a very seed fisherman or a fisherman. I'm going to introduce you to some of these guys. We got Big D, Dennis Frenzy. <laughs> I've known Dennis for over 40 years. Never had an opportunity to fish with Dennis. Dennis is not only crab fish, He's a professional longliner, hook and line, and he'll explain that later on. This guy has set, he's set more line and hooks, probably enough to go around the world two times. That's how much line this guy has set and baited up. Professional fisherman, I'm glad to have you there, Big D. Okay, everybody's had their trouble child, right? I grew up with Andy. I know what kind of, you know. I know for a fact his dad was wondering, what are we going to do with this kid? And Andy will explain later, but, you know, he finally got him on a fishing boat and saved his life. Mr. Andy Pitter, his dad, he's our engineer today. He's been on some of the top crab boats in the Bering Sea, engineer. Siberian Sea, Standing Rose. And you know what? I feel very safe when they're on the boat. If anything goes wrong, this is the guy that I'm relying on. Danny Clinton and Young Horton. All right. Rose, I know that. I know that. Myla, Melissa, Tate, 
These girls, they live here. If any, if you want to know anything about catching hand, ask them. They're the heart of our operation here. They work the galley, they'll be around passing out stuff. Um, hardest workers on the boat, because they do it all. They'll even come up here, you'll watch, you'll see them. Thank you girls, appreciate it. <laughs> all right, here's the, <laughs> here's the complete brain of the operation. <laughs> Madison. Madison's been on this tour for 17 years. You'll see her picture up here off, out the ice. She's been in the Bering Sea. She's beat ice, she's sorted crab, Bering Sea fish. But she's been on here seven, she didn't have a choice. This is David's daughter, the owner of the <laughs> <laughs> Let's get out of here, huh?
so that we're not talking over each other. If you could possibly have uh, service all the way there and back, you need to take or make a call by all means. Just remove yourself from the crowd so we're not talking over each other. Um, one of the things that separates this boat from a lot of boats, if you are a deadly cat fan, is there anybody that's never watched Deadly Cat? Never watched it? Okay, not calling you out. Me and McGee, we're not on it, so you're not missing anything. <laughs> but, deadly catch scan, the boat that you're on, this is the most incredible thing. This boat has been 26 years out there playing tag with death. And this is the boat that got hit second season. Uh, episode, uh, I believe, two or four or something like that. But anyway, got hit by a rogue wave. That video is playing in the gallery. You go back to that gallery when you go through the door, and you do have to come down this end. You go through that door on the right, uh, right hand side with a TV monitor on the wall. It's a four minute DVD just moved in there. So you can check that out. Um, also, this part's, <laughs> this part's tough for me to get through. Uh, Mary C. Crab Fix book. Spent 26 years out there myself. And uh, play tag with Greg Reed, and I worked on several books, and they're very cool. This boat that you're riding on has something that no other Kingcraft boat has in the entire fleet. And what it is, when you go back in that Gallic boat, there's a gift shop. <laughs>
have to get those out later. <coughs> it's going to be quite the chore to get them out. Big D, he's going to come out here. He's going to bait up these hooks. Uh, feel free to ask some questions. I'm going to go up in the wheelhouse. If I can pass the driving test, I'm going to drive while the captain comes down. And he'll tell you all about this so some of the history of it. You guys doing good up there? You need jackets? Let me know. You need, you're getting a full deal up there. Yeah, where are you from? Utah? <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> Texas. Okay. Well, here you're gonna have to gut it out because they took all the seats. You take it up with them. There's somebody from Michigan down here. I was straight with them. So they go out. <laughs> Thanks for being here. <laughs> On the show, the wizard's the biggest, right? Wizard.
Have you have you met Freddie Mokitai? Oh yeah. Is he as crazy as he is on TV? Yeah. He well, looks at. Oh yeah. When he's drinking, stay away from him. Yeah, he's, he knows me well enough, but he won't mess with me because he's got to respect the captain. Yeah. But, you know, just a crazy Hawaiian. He, he seems very quick tempered. <laughs> Somebody wants to take his hook, he goes fucking nuts. Yeah, yeah, no, he's a lot of he's a lot of that's the joke. Yeah. I don't know, but we're on the boat for three hours. Up to 160, 170. They had 
had not, it was an average of 50 foot, 60 foot. We had waves recorded at 70 foot. I heard, on my boat, I heard 11 maydays when boats in trouble. This boat got hit by one of those 70 foot waves that rolled it on its side. Now, we've got four fish holes on these. We've got one, two, three, four. Now, when you got crab on your in your fish holes, you got water, pumping water, salt water in them at all the time to supply oxygen to keep them alive. So we've got these hatches that are this big on every one. We got to have those open for the water to come out and circulate. This boat had every every fish hole full of crab, so those hatches were off. When it took that roll. When it rolled to the, off to its side, what do you think happened to that water? Half that water went out. All the weight now is off the other side, so it wasn't coming back. Vance Jones got out of Mayday, told the Coast Guard, we're rolling over, we're abandoning ship. And luckily, him and the crew got off this boat. Now, a boat that was close heard that Mayday come up to him, Surfing down 50 foot waves, managed to get everybody on their boat and took them to Dutch Harbor. Now, Vance Jones, first thing when he got into Dutch Harbor, he went down to the lumber store, bought himself a sheet of plywood and a can of spray paint, and he put for sale. I'm out of here. I knew Vance very well, known him for a lot of years. David and a partner of his ended up buying this boat. Got it fixed up, got it ready for crabbing. Hired a gentleman by the name of Murray Damrath. Now Murray was the engineer for Phil on the Cornelia Marie for a lot of years. They hired him to run this boat. Great engineer, good captain. Filled the boat up, headed into Dutch. Now, like a good captain, you know, you stay up for a lot of hours. You know, especially when you're on craft. You know, 30, 40, 50 hours just hauling gear. So when he was on, on his way to Dutch, he said to the crew, he goes, go ahead, you guys, you go to sleep. I got this. So he, they were sleeping, he got it. Murray ended up waking up when he hit a 500 foot cliff on this boat. Now, He's up on the rocks, there's cliffs all around. They couldn't have had a chip, you know. I mean, there was cliffs all around it. So as a good engineer, first thing he did is he hit the main alarm to alert the crew something's wrong. Went down and started shutting up, shutting everything down, all the engines. Started checking the fuel. Now there's eight fuel tanks, two, four, six, eight. These boats don't run on salt water started checking all the fuel tanks. I mean, remember, this thing's beating on the rocks, getting the holes torn in it. You know, all the compartments. He kept checking salt water, salt water, salt water, until he found one that didn't have it. Turned that one on, got everything fired up, finally got off the rocks, got all the pumps going, headed to Dutch, called Dutch Harbor, and said, I'm in trouble, I got all my pumps going, but Something's wrong, we're sinking. I need to get this thing out of the water as soon as possible. Luckily, they had a spot for it. Got this thing in the Dutch, pulled it out of the water. First thing he did, he called David. And said, David, I really messed up, man. I wrecked your boat, it's bad. First thing David said was, is everyone safe? He goes, yes. He goes, okay. So David called the insurance company. Him and the insurance guy came up to Dutch Harbor. The insurance guy looked at the boat I've been doing this job for 30 years. I've never seen a boat in this bad condition. He said, we'll fix it up. We'll put a whole new bottom. But you're going to have to find yourself a new insurance company. <laughs> so, lucky boat or unlucky boat? I think this is the luckiest boat in the ocean. I know for a fact it's not going back to the Bering Sea. This boat's right here for you guests, for you people. That's the history of the boat you're on today. Thank you. I'm going to turn you over to Big Chief.
you can explain a little bit about what he was doing here. Thank you. All right, thanks, Rock.
2,200 boats, somebody is on the ground all the time. But you can't have all that bait going down and those fish coming up without attracting some attention. And this started out with killer whales and orcas. They would come by, a pod would come by and just start taking bites out of your fish. And just that, I mean, they ruined the fish. You couldn't, you couldn't sell it at that point. Orcas don't eat that much. We were, ca we were catching such volume of fish that it was frustrating, but you, you would fish through it. Well, in a matter of about seven or eight years, their cousins started showing up, sperm whales. And we're talking 40, we're talking Moby Dick, 40, 60 feet, big old hungry whales. And when they showed up, it was game over. You could not fish around them. You could maybe fish around one or two and still catch some fish. There's three, over three fish, you were done. You would not, if you had a set that you thought had seven or 8,000 pounds on it, you would catch maybe 200 pounds. They would just sit there and floss their teeth with that gear. <laughs> so, uh, seriously, I mean, I never saw, for 10 years or 15 years, I never saw a sperm whale that didn't have grooves cut in its, in its, in its nose. It just would sit there and just eat, eat fish off the line. And they would stay down there, there'd be two down there eating, one just sitting there about 30 feet from you, looking at you, a guy about the size of a softball. And you knew, as soon as one of them other ones came up, he was going down. And it was, you just couldn't do it. But we we'll probably won't have that today. But what we did do today is yesterday afternoon, I set one just like this. I, I, I say I, we set one just like this. And uh, we are going to go full in. And then we are going to put this one back in the water. What I'd like from you guys is if you could just keep your seats until we get this one back in the water. That way nobody's standing up in front of anybody. And whatever we catch, we'll share with you as soon as we get this one fishing. Um, so, basically, are you guys ready to go fishing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. We'll make a little room here. Hey, Big D, say what? Never, uh, there was one way to get rid of them whales. How did I know that was coming? I think this is the way that Captain Ron invented. Now, say it was a little overcast, a little more overcast than this. And like I said, there's boats all over the place. Everybody's out there fishing. You're getting whales really bad. If you were to stop at a knot, put buoys on your gear, circle around the first boat you see over there, and come back to your gear. I, to this day, don't know what happens, but it, it seems as though you can pull your gear without fish, uh, without whales. I'm not sure what, I, I don't know where they go. But when you get in town, somebody usually tells you where they went. Uh, it is a pretty bad deal. But I mean, those fish were worth so much money, you had to try everything. I mean, you needed to get those whales off. That became a pretty big problem. Oh, uh, man. Guys that just generally do that, man. Drag those whales around somebody else and then take off through your gear. Yeah, guy the whale. Guy standing guy, guy be standing on the deck waving at you. Hi, nice to see you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, right. We're out of here. Get back in the town and it's like, I know what you did. <laughs> Alright, I see buoys coming and I don't see any whales around us, but I think we're in good shape. No, but I see these are a little tangled up here. That's alright. Birds are working something there. They'll come into view for you guys. <laughs> you guys do know the difference between fishing and catching, right? Yeah, uh, okay, I get some positive nods there. That's just a disclaimer. I mean, Jeff Ron up there, he'd tell you the difference between fishing and catching is about 30 miles a year. If you're running 30 miles a year, you're going to catch something. That guy that owns this and he's big he works for, it. the fact that he didn't sleep was just, you, you, you caught, you caught. The season was seven days long, you, that's how long he's been. He did not stop. Yeah, this could be a challenge. Oh, you got it.
anybody wants to take your job though. Oh, Tangle. I know, we need somebody. Maybe I should light it on fire, maybe it'll fly down. Maybe somebody can pull up on it. Fire, we're done. Straight down, Cap, and it's tight. I don't really want to break it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is another frustrating part of long line, and this happens when you're at 2,000 feet, too. I'm going to take a little. Hold it. 
and those hooks jump and they go flying right by Big Steve's ear. The first time it happens to me, a guy goes, grab it! <laughs> yeah, Kurt Skia goes, grab it! And I looked at it and said, well, I said some stuff. <laughs> and he jumped over the cleaning table and he grabbed it and put it back in. It is something you do if you have the experience that it will eventually get Okay, you're getting faster now. Turn her a little star, it's getting really tight. Watch it, Andy. Really not much you get to do, but wait. Let's see if it's going to part or jump. Oh, there we go. Cool. That's all right. Which way do you want me to go, Big D? It doesn't really matter. We haven't got anything on the end of this. Yeah. Almost looks like yeah, I'm gonna keep it. Almost looks like there's steel pouring it. Oh, there is steel pouring it.
here in the metal core. It got stretched pretty good. That's cool. Alright. No guarantees we'll ever see this again either. But <laughs> it has been some really high tides out here. And on an average day, we're going to have 18 or 19 foot tides. But we've had some big ones. about a day. 
day and a half. Cap Dave Lassie, the guy who owns this boat, to come into town. He came in on his first boat, a boat called the Ballot, and it was full of crap. And I marched right down there and introduced myself and put my best foot forward and said, hey man, I would really like to go to Alaska. Well, you could tell he was tired. He hadn't slept for a couple of days. He just kind of looked at me sideways and said, I don't need anybody to go to Alaska. So on the venture, not the game. Uh, John's about ready to get off his boat. He goes, but I do got a guy who's getting off my boat next week, and I need somebody to finish his crab season. He said, hey, I'm your guy. I'm a really good crabber. I've been doing it for years. So that was the deal. I went home to the Harrison's Cup, came back up, and went for crab in the day. Well, about an hour into that, I realized I had lied to the man. I was not a very good crabber. I mean, these guys on that boat were really good crabbers. They kept that block going wide open. 24-7, they didn't stop to eat, they didn't stop to sleep, they didn't stop to talk to the new guy, they just kept working. And it was all I could do to keep up, and just running around, and I was actually learning something I realized later, but for the most part, I was getting beat up. But it took about four days to fill the boat, and I'd never seen anybody fill a boat in January before, so it was impressive. We came in, I'm trying to decide whether I want to go back out or not, and I said, eh, I can't get much worse. Well, I was wrong again. It got a lot. We went out and the wind came up and it blew hard. I mean, 40, 45 is a lot on a 67 foot boat. Now, I've been in it before, excuse me, but we just turned and got into the waves and just jogged until the weather came down. Well, he didn't consider that. We just kept right on fishing and it was brutal. I mean, we were falling down, pots were tipping over, bait was spilling off the boat. It was rough. But we filled the boat another four days. And uh, the wind came down and we headed into town. Well, by then I was doing the math. And I had just made more in a week than I'd ever made in a whole crab season before. So I stayed with David for quite some time. About as long as he fished. In 1992, he started fishing his first new king crab boat. And it was a beast. It was a really beautiful boat. And we filled it up often. And we just kept going. And he kept fishing. And he built another one in 94. And he had this one. And he built a lot of drag boats. Pretty soon he had too many boats. He could not fish. He had people running his boats and he was running this off. So I went to work with his partner. And he was building and buying these crab boats. And that guy also had a smaller boat. And it was more of a long liner than a crab. And it was a very, kind of a famous long liner up there. And I fished on it for about 25 years. I would fish from early spring to late fall on there, and I would crab wherever they had room for it. Well, in 2016, we were coming back from Alaska with a load of halibut, and we were about 30 miles north of Vancouver, Canada, and the boat caught on fire. And it was a bad one. We couldn't fight it. It got in between the decks. We had like five minutes to get off the boat, and we did. But we were in luck, there was a sailboat relatively close, and it was an older couple from England. And they picked us up and, you know, got us on their boat. So we're sitting there talking to the guy, and his wife comes up out of the galley. I swear, she had this big old tray with these little tiny porcelain cups. So you boys want some tea? And now we're sitting there drinking tea and watching our hopes and dreams burn up. That was a pretty surreal afternoon. Finally, you know, the Coast Guard came and got us. But nobody even had a wallet. They got us checked through Canada, got us home. By the time I got home, my phone had been ringing off the wall. And uh, one of the guys called was David. He told me what he was doing up here with you guys. I said, wow, Dave, that's cool. That's what you've been talking about for 20 years. I'm glad it's working out for you, but I'm going fishing. I had a friend who had a new boat built, and I went to work for him. So I'm fishing away for a couple of years, but David keeps calling, you know, just checking on me. <laughs> and uh, finally it kind of wore me down and in 2019 I said, okay Dave, here's the deal. So I've been working with the same five guys for 25 years and my working vocabulary dwindled to about 20 words. He said, yeah, well, there's about 10 of them you can't use on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew it wasn't going to be real easy, but I figured I was up to the task. So I come up, he gives me the headset, gives me a pat on the back and he said, Big hey, just go out there and tell them something from the heart. No problem, Dave, I can do that. Well, I came out, and I stood right here, and I'd like to again. 
I, my throat would get tight. I'd look at you guys. My eyes would start watering. I couldn't even put two sentences together. It was not very comfortable for me, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't for you guys. And I would actually pick somebody and just stare at them until they were just as uncomfortable as I was. <laughs> By then, somebody like Andy would come over and take my place, and I'd go sit someplace and tie a knot and wait for the next movie to come up. And I figured, well, it happens to everybody. But it did get better. And by the way, I mean, I would just go home and just stare at the ceiling all night long, wondering how many people are going to be on the boat. What am I going to tell these people? And it was pretty stressful. But finally, 2019 came to an end. When I went home, I got on a crab boat and went crab. Well, 2020 came, and then it came over. So there was no cruise ship, so there was no tour. So I went up to Alaska fishing. So I came back home, went crabbing, and... Uh, 2021 came, COVID was still hanging around, still no cruise ships, uh, right back up to Alaska. And it was getting pretty comfortable with this whole scenario. I was liking it. And uh, so 2022 Cubs got down there, grabbing away for about two weeks, and I get a call from David. He's like a little kid. He says, like, oh, we're going to start the tour back up. And I'm like, oh, goody. <laughs> <laughs> but then, actually, my wife heard that. She said, why don't you just go up there and just do it? like to talk to me. Anyway, so I came up and I figured I was ready this time. I was ready. I came out here, I looked at you guys, and I didn't see a whole lot of change. I mean, you guys still intimidated me, but now you're starting to irritate me. <laughs> and I figured this is not going to end well. So I'm, one day I'm just standing here like this, and, and the chains are down, everybody's out. I get a tug on my leg. And I look down, it's a little six year old girl. Her name is Kennedy. I just turned down and I said, what do you need? She goes, hey, Pete, can I have a hug? <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, so I bent down, she gave me a hug, and she go run off and do whatever she was doing. I'm over here doing what I'm doing. As it turns out, what she was doing was collecting hugs from Big D. And she just kept coming back, like, three times. And I was feeling pretty good about the whole thing. I'm finally reaching somebody. So everybody gets off the boat. I go up and I tell Dave, he said, that is true. And he goes, he just sits there and smiles, didn't say a word. So I just left, I went home. Went to sleep, came back the next morning, and I have no idea what that little girl had in her, or even who put her on this boat. But if I did, I'd put it in a bottle and sell it. Because she changed the way that I look at this job 100%. And she changed the way I look at you guys probably a little more than that. And from that point on, I mean, if you even make direct eye contact with me, I'm going to go here soon. I'm going to go up and find out. And I've done it a lot. I found out that most people have a lot more interesting stories than I do. So I just, I, I mean, I'm honored and <coughs> thankful that you guys will even take time out of your vacation to come out here and see what we do. So I just wanted to say thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry about the pick. I don't know what happened. one 
across about, the crowd here. You know, a pretty large bird. But we've been watching this nest because this time these guys have to fly. They're, if they're going to make it through the winter, they need to get out and about. 